So um, uh, first and foremost, uh, hello to everybody. Uh, delighted that you have decided to join us today on short notice for this webinar on the incoming EU regulations around DORA. Now it's it's not DORA the Explorer, it's uh, DORA the uh, Operational Resilience Act. Um, and I think this is super interesting because we already have a lot of uh, regulatory mandates at play, um, both globally and across Europe. We've got the NIST directive, we've got GDPR, but in the financial services sector, we also have a lot of uh, regulatory mandates from the central banks in the different uh, countries and different jurisdictions who hold financially regulated entities to account. Um, so to make sense of, of what DORA means and all of these different regulations, I have two of the most knowledgeable people working in the industry are hopefully going to help provide some uh, clear advice and guidance uh, around this topic. Um, firstly, we've got Rosa, who is the head of governance, risk and compliance and professional services in Smart Tech 247. Uh, Rosa has worked in business management consultancy for over the last 10 years, implementing quality and risk programs, uh, as well as business continuity and information management system programs. She's done this for some of the, the biggest multinationals in the world. And as someone who has seen her work firsthand, she is an absolute subject matter expert um, and best in class when it comes to these, I would say, complex regulatory frameworks. And she has a mission on this webinar I think that's to demonstrate to everyone that compliance can be fun. I'm I'm yet to I'm yet to to follow her her train of thought. I will admit, but uh, we're, we we'll see how she gets on. Um, and we have Khalid, of course. Um, Khalid has been in this industry for over 33 years, and um, he's he's held some very senior roles where he led uh, security architecture teams um, at Cisco in Europe. Um, and he also worked very extensively with Verizon, where he ran a governance, risk and compliance team. Um, and they would have engaged in high profile risk assessments, uh, audits and across third parties in the financial and the banking sector. Um, he's now with one of our, our very close partners, Forcepoint, where he's helping uh, organizations to implement uh, zero trust architecture across organizations networks, which we know building those types of frameworks are complex and there's lots of moving parts and also how how to implement data first sassy roadmaps across organizations. So I believe that both Rosa and Khalid's perspectives and experience make for a very interesting conversation across a topic which personally I, I believe is complex, given the various different uh, regulatory mandates and frameworks that financial organizations need to wrestle with. So I guess to start off, and uh, it's nice for a change for me to be on this side of the table, um, so I get to ask the questions. Rosa, um, with all of these different buzzwords flying around the place, um, how does DORA work with the likes of NIS and GDPR, and do we even need this, or is this just an extra layer of bureaucracy? Uh, what's your perspective, and if you could tell us maybe where this fits in the greater scheme of, of regulations that we're now looking at. OK, so that's a big question, but I'll try and address it and see if I don't um, if I manage to get the scope very well understood. Look, um, Dora comes in uh, to resolve a few issues um, across board, exactly because we have all that in place already. We have so many things going on uh, at, at, at national level, at the data privacy uh, level, at um, you know, uh, cybersecurity programs going on. And um, Dora comes in to resolve basically a kind of question that is needed to harmonize the interpretation of how these things are all being implemented. So it's really it's really actually refreshing to to get this. I mean, organizations have been struggling for many, many years to decide how far do I go in implementation in implementing security controls? You know, what is what is required of me? You know, although there are standards out there and there are standards that are followed and there's a lot of them out there, very good ones. It's like up to where do I need to go? Up to where is really a good practice or what is it that I really need to ensure? And Dora comes and resolves that for you. It gives you a very clear checklist. That, guys, no doubt, this is what you need to implement. And that's what's making it very exciting. So um, 
it brings in a very clear um, checklist of what organization, organizations need to, to implement to bring, a, bring a more, more security for the citizen. You know, at the end of the day, um, we've been asking for this or been waiting for this since 2008. So since since the financial markets all rocketed and and, and we had that kind of like panic attack moment, they, they, we, we realized that the financial system is so uh, dependent on each other and how the entities are, are dependent on each other, we realized that, okay, hang on, so we need something very clear and very, very concrete to put everybody on the same stepping stone and everybody working towards the same goal. And Dr. Dara, it fits this, you know, it really fits this. It does, it brings that that baseline that we so need. So Rosa, um, on, on that point, if I were to say, um, would, it, would it be fair to assume that the GDPR is more around how every organization handles personal identifiable information, how they collect it, how they store it, how they process it, how they share it, whereas Dora is much more about keeping the integrity of the financial system operating smoothly by ensuring that there's transparency um, around potential risks or breaches or incidents. Is that a fit? Would, would that be a fair summary? To a certain extent, yes, but it's a little bit more than that, in my opinion. Um, so, so what we have here is GDPR came and gave the requirements um, of what is necessary to protect the, you know, the identity and the information of, of, of individuals, right? Dora comes in and says, okay, we're going to take this a little bit step further and we're going to actually protect the value of individuals. At the end of the day, the what, what the EU is trying to achieve is that we get um, confidence confidence in the digitalization, be it to use or process information, so how is my identity protected, but also how my value is protected. At the end of the day, you know, and nobody wants to lose their savings or 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 be hacked and you know the the the, the balance in the and the, the bank account all of a sudden be zero. So and then the, the EU is ultimately trying to gain um individual trust in digitalization. So uh, what 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 Dar it comes and does and they you know they are they are not they are not they, they complement each other shall i say so gdpr will go and say to you look guys as a data processor you have to have tools and 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 systems and and processes in place to protect the personal information of individuals and what dora comes and tells you says okay now um, you also must show you not you know any tools to to because it you know it does actually integrate in 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 the article nine of Dora. Um, they actually go and say um, the, the entity needs to have solutions to prevent the lack of ability and the impairment of authentic authenticity and integrity of the of information. So um, it is. You need to protect on one and in the other one, it kind of tells you what you have to have in place to protect. So they, they kind of like complement each other, in my opinion. OK, uh, Khalid, in, in your experience, have we seen um, initiatives like this before across other industry verticals or other industry segments where they're trying to benchmark um, or I implement an act where this type of compliance is being looked for? Well, so we we had this uh, some years ago with the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley Act, which was really for financial organizations in the US that were uh, as uh, they had a certain uh, level of transactions that were happening and therefore registered. So the Security Exchange and uh, Exchange Commission, the, 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 the body in the US would mandate organizations. In fact, they were fined as well. So European banks that were trading or working in the US were subject to it. So we and we had a Japanese version called JSOX. So we had SOX uh, and, and JSOX for, for the Japanese version. We've also seen uh, a number of other things within uh, the industry, uh, like PCI DSS, which is really for payment card industries and that had acquirers and merchants and so forth. So again, it was looking at financial uh, uh, transactions. Again, the intent was uh, for the SOX, the intent was to ensure that there was accountability. Uh, for PCI, it was around commercial uh, viability for the um, effectively the, the, the uh, MasterCards and, and Visas because they were seeing a lot of money, so it was financial crime driven. But I've not seen something as 
uh, as important as DORA because Oh, I remember when I did a lot of PCI work with a lot of uh, big banks. I was a QSA at one time as well. And what I found was that a lot of banks were willing to pay the fine. It was a trade off between how much do you pay for fine or what do you do in terms of remediation? And they could choose to pay the fine. But I think with Dora, we have uh, certain articles that actually talk about articles within, uh, you know, uh, criminal penalties, Article 52. Uh, and we have, again, uh, an article, you know, uh, within uh, publication of administration penalties, which is Article 54, that tells you that, uh, you know, the oversight body that will ultimately inspect it has the power to do a lot. And the other big thing, and, and going back to, you know, what was said earlier, is that this is legal framework. This is not an optional, you know, maybe it's nice to have, it's a menu driven thing. It isn't. It's actually now mandated across all of Europe. Uh, so it has EU states now that have signed up to it. Uh, there is a, a body that ultimately can 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 inspect it, can manage it. So it's a very serious type of legislation. So yes, we have seen this. Uh, I've also seen this uh, actually across the Middle East when I went to the Middle East uh, on behalf of Verizon, uh, and we've seen banking legislation that has come about uh, effectively around you know control effectiveness. So again, we've seen technical controls, but we haven't seen it at a level that Dora is right now which to me is at a board level. It, this talks about, you know, people like the sea level heads having accountability at a level that I've never seen with PCI. I haven't seen it. Uh, SOX did have an element of that, uh, but this actually has a lot more um, uh, legal so, frameworks behind it. So, so Kali, that, 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 that actually led into my next question, which what are the consequences of this? And um, in 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 the last number of years, we've seen the bar raised in terms of the potential consequences for um, covering up uh, cyber breaches. And I think one of the most profound um, examples was when the CISO of Uber was sentenced to three years in prison for covering up the 2016 breach, which affected 50 million users. So. Um, in 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 your opinion, and I, I think Ross is in agreement with you because I was I was watching you nodding your head. Um, <laughs> did, 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 did that this actually takes the liability for non um, uh, conformity of of the rules of this act, and it places it on the heads of the leadership within the organisation, which I guess is a fundamental uh, sea shift shift in the way people think about this regulatory mandate. That's right. So, uh, you know, it it calls, I mean, one of the biggest chapters within it, uh, you know, is the risk management and governance and oversight. So it's chapter two. And in chapter two, there are quite a large number of articles. Actually, uh, everything is driven around what they call articles. And there's a lot of articles around that. And it talks about, you know, creating uh, a number of bodies internally. And it talks about how you manage it uh, in terms of, you know, the Uber see, So I can I have experienced um, in the breaches that I investigated with, uh, you know, my, my ex employers. Uh, we have had a CEO of a bank that was doing things untold. We had to do a lot of, you know, forensics research. So I you know, experience of sending some of them to prison, taking some of them out of prison, wrongly accused. So that mm. was exciting. So, you know, to your point, Ron, it can compliance be exciting? Yes, it can when the wrong guy's in prison yeah. and you show evidence that actually he shouldn't have been because someone else was doing things and you could pull them out. And then there was one where it was actually, unfortunately, it was a it was a bank. And again, the MasterCard and Visa shared service providers and there was a conflict of interest and they blamed one, the other one blamed the other for a breach. We had to investigate and ultimately determine, you know, who was actually at fault. Now, so in this, Dora, uh, uh, thing, your question, absolutely, there is a lot more uh, at stake. Uh, it's an EU driven thing. Uh, each state will start to sh um, show more of the mandate and more of the teeth. Uh, they haven't been explicit about that yet, but they have a year or so uh, before they can do that. But yes, ultimately, it gets to a level that we haven't seen in, in the past. So so on that note, Rosa, what I, what exactly does the timeline look like? Because when you look at it, it's a little bit confusing. There's different dates. There's addendums to some of it. Um, there's different. So can you talk through what it looks like from a timeline perspective for us, please? OK. I think here we let's go back to the GDPR experience. 
<laughs> because I think um, the the way GDPR came out and the way GDPR was implemented in um, in uh, Europe is going to give us a bit of kind of like look and feel of how of how things are going to because it's kind of regulation that was implemented or is being implemented in a similar fashion as GDPR was because it's a directive and it, it's not a directive it's a regulation that needs to be implemented to until January 2025. Um, let's please all learn from GDPR and not leave everything until the last minute, uh, because the whole thing is like, oh, as of January 2025, uh, the fines are going to be applicable, blah, 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 blah. No, uh, organisations already need to start implementing this as soon as possible. And there is going to be, a, there is a, a very strong awareness now that, hang on a second, I have only two years to review my uh, relationships with my providers. I have only two years to start implementing here, ensuring that I have back-to-back -back contracts with my providers and that they are ensuring all the requirements I need to go because I have to be good for compliance as of uh, you know, January 2025. So um, it's very simple. You have to start acting. You have to start acting right now. You have to start checking and implementing your risk management framework right now. Um, so by the time you get there, um, you know, you have this already matured in your organization and it's already working and flowing. So two years is not a lot of time. Although this is building on some, so most of these organizations already have information security controls implemented, but we are not talking only information security controls. It is a, a, a connection between risk management, business continuity, information security, and even quality. It is not, so it, it is time that organizations start to see this as an integrated process and not as a singular, you know, okay, this goes to compliance or that goes to information security or now I have a risk management team. Why, the reason why I was I was uh, um, um, shaking my head is that it was really exciting. What's really exciting about it is, is that the reinforcing, um, now legally <laughs> reinforcing, then high management has to get involved. <laughs> I absolutely love this. I'm sorry. I really absolutely love this. From anybody in a compliance function that has ever tried to implement a, a management system, you will find that the biggest hurdle you have is getting management on board, getting their buy-in, giving their, they have to set the message across the organization. We must understand that ISA has been pushing for risk-based thinking since 2000, okay? Since the 9001-2000 the, the standard, it's been very clear and the message is always through. Risk management is absolutely important. It's a critical success factor in organizations. It's what's going to make an organization resilient. It has been the message for many, many years. But what we have, and, and, and anyone who's on this side or does audits or does any kind of compliance check, we come across it all the time. That risk management is, uh, the risk register is put together to show compliance. Um, it's, it's you know, the, some poor sods or, uh, responsibility organization to, to follow up with the business heads and go, OK, we need your risks. What are your five top risks? And give it to me and let's fill out the register and what have you. That is not the objective of risk management. And when the, a, a regulation comes in here and says, hi, guys, top management has to be aware of this. Top management has to get directly involved and understand, do a real context analysis, see how your organi organization is affecting the whole ecosystem of the financial system. Check, you know, how you are influencing or what's influencing you upstream, how you influence downstream. Please, guys, this is strategic. So it's a really strong message saying management teams have to get involved. Make this real. Make risk management real. OK, and it's no longer only information security. It is uh, an ICT with information security. It's, you know, look at it from an integrated perspective. You have to see um, information. Uh, you have to see ICT risks as, as, a, as, as an integrated whole holistic picture so yes it is exciting to see this it's it's oh. it's a clear mandate yeah your 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 passion for uh, uh governance risk and compliance um I, I would almost say it's infectious rosa but uh <laughs> um not not only just yet but um on that note khalid right um i mean when we look at the cyber security and the data governance landscape 
there are some very significant headwinds and challenges, right? It's estimated there is over 3 million job vacancies in the sector. We know that the scale and the sophistication of cyber attacks is increasing. We're dealing with a lot of geopolitical tensions globally, which are resulting in increased attacks on critical infrastructure. Um, and organizations are looking to reduce cost. They're looking to drive operational efficiency by embracing technology. And all of this uh, introduces risk into the equation. So in your mind, given those challenges, what are the biggest challenges an organization faces when they want to implement DORA effectively? And what do you believe are the first steps they should take um, in addressing uh, these challenges? I know that's a, a, a long winded question, but if you could share your general perspective. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll share share my experiences, I suppose would be the best though. I think I think yeah. uh, first and foremost, uh, given that this is a, a legis legislation with uh, potential criminal proceedings that can take place, so Article 52, um, what we've got to do is, you know, first and foremost, uh, be cognizant of the fact that we have had all sorts of compliance and regulations and risks thrown at uh, at a poor CISO that might sit or a CRO. Uh, usually doesn't get uh, much attention at the board. So he comes in with his risk register and they probably tell him, well, we've got landscaping to do. So off you go, you know, maybe come back another time. I think the first thing to do is is ultimately understand and classify your 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 internal systems, your assets, your people. So you you've got a baseline. And what I've seen happen is, is certainly in my experience, is that if you create a a a, a board level, um, you know, uh, oversight and governance framework that ultimately supports that with legislation, then you have the potential to actually create what we used to call a SIP, a security improvement program. That normally comes out of an assessment like a BIA, but ultimately, and in fact, uh, uh, the, the articles call for a BIA. So, you know, one of the things you'll find is that, you know, in, in uh, Article 10 has detection, operational resilience, and there's a call for doing a BIA. So ultimately, business impact assessment uh, to at least understand what you've got and where your gaps are. Now, what I find interesting here and we've done this in the Middle East purely because of geopolitics that took place between nation states that had very high sophisticated uh, zero day um, you know uh, vulnerabilities that they were holding they had uh, huge amounts of funding uh, that you know you could only dream of um, what we've got to do is ensure that there is a open level communication and oversight with the various parties internally the other thing that I'm noticing is that as we go and we notice this again in, in some of the big enterprises I worked in is the ability to get information from your third party suppliers. I remember, uh, you know, performing a, a pretty large risk assessment for a, for an organization that had it had a breach or something had gone wrong, it would actually kill people. It, it would uh, the, the fumigation plant was a critical asset to this particular organization. And this is a very big organization. The, and the fumigation plant would ultimately need seawater that used it to cool. What was happening was some of the third party suppliers were refusing to provide a, a much more information. It was a black box. They said, we've got it. It does everything you need. What do you care? Why do you need to know more? And there was very little that we could do. I mean, this organization is at the, you know, the, the provider, the third party provider is at right at the top level. You know, you, they have they have influences at the government level. So it was very difficult to get that level of information. So I think initially it has to be understand your state, figure out where your data is. I think data still is the key concern for people. And the reason I say this is because we have had to to use cloud. We are using the cloud. We unfortunately don't even admit to it. We don't know it. And then when I go in and I show evidence, we see cloud. Uh, and so there is this, well, in the cloud world, there is this shared responsibility matrix. Who owns part of what? 
So how do you know? So you've got to know where your data is. In fact, the the articles actually talk about mechanisms to promptly detect anomalous activity. That's in Article 10. Um, you, it says shall devote sufficient resources and capabilities to monitor user activity. So again, how do you monitor user activity unless you know what they're actually supposed to do and what the baseline is? And you see the behavior indicators of what we call it force point language. We call it indicators of behavior. So that behavior changes. It's doing things that you weren't expecting them to do. And that's sort of stuff you will get once you understand your critical assets, you understand your critical resources and the assets. I don't just mean, you know, physical assets, it's logical assets, it's, you know, data assets, it's uh, all the policy process technology assets. Once you've got that, you can then look at what the gap looks like and ultimately, you know, create a framework. And that's why to me, the type of zero trust concept uh, and SASE concept gives you that efficiency Khalid, uh, and will, because will, we are will, going to get Khalid, more legislation. Will, will you explain to the listeners yeah. what is SASE ah, in, 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 yes. simple, in simple terms? What is it and why is it important? OK, yeah, yeah, it's effectively uh, we call it secure access service edge. So in the past we had two types of people and maybe some of the listeners would know this. You have a knock for a network operation center and you traditionally have a sock for a security operations operation center, the network and the security. I mean, that's the easiest way to describe it. You typically find two different guys that's consolidating into what we call NSOC. So ultimately what SASE is, is the ability to have network access and SD-WAN and, and so forth, which would typically lie with the network technology team who run routers and, and switches and so forth, uh, but ultimately have a security play and you'd have the traditional content security, which would be things like CASP, uh, which is, uh, you know, um, uh, access brokers uh, for the cloud. You'd have a SWIG, which is, uh, you know, a, a web gateway to detect threats that might be coming off websites that you might visit. You may download ransomware. All of this, so the network and the traditional security, including data security, which is a core component of, of SASE, uh, is then put together into what we call SASE. And that's part of a bigger framework, which is called the architecture around zero trust. So trust, verify, validate, segment as you see fit. And ultimately that creates an ability to then add any compliance that things people might throw at you, it allows you to then build that capability. I hope that sassy conversation and uh, it's good to do it with diagrams, but <laughs> yeah, no, you've done you've done a very eloquent job. Rosa, can I ask you a question? One of the uh, problems, uh, common problems with GDPR um, since its conception, uh, not for people like you, but for a lot of people, there's been a confusion of whether they fall under the GDPR regulation or not. And it, I would argue there's still a degree of ambiguity around that um, and the definition of how much PII you collect and so forth. And then if you have a breach, that breach might be a denial of service attack and it may not have affected any of your PII data and you may, may have lost no information. But there's a common misconception that if you're a 50 person company and you've had some sort of issue that you need to ring Helen Dixon's department and she's wrestling with Google and Twitter and Facebook and everyone else. Right. And, you know, you're going into a queue of 50,000 um, uh, alerts which have been sent in and it's probably never going to get looked at. So when we talk about Dora, um, is it clearly defined who is going to have a regulatory requirement under this? Is it crystal clear? Yes. So do I ask um, and do we cabin? envisage around? Do we anticipate it will spread to other, uh, like, for example, if we looked at the health sector in Europe, for example, there's a lot of issues there. Do we anticipate that yes. other critical infrastructure will start coming under this type of scrutiny as well? Or what's your perspective yes. on, uh, I, 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 I know I, it's a long question. That is a certainty. That is, a, that is an absolute certainty. The financial st the sector, given, you know, the the, the the great impact on the stability of the European Union of the financial markets was priority number one without okay. a doubt okay and 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 really re necessary uh let, let, let's play it uh, you know everybody really wants uh common understanding on this and make sure that we're all doing very 
very uh, similar actions to ensure stability and less disruptions as possible because it affects the economic balance of the, of the whole European Union. But without a doubt that the European Commission's plan and um, and also the the what is really being prepared in, in this too is that everything else will follow. OK, all the other key infrastructure areas of 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 the uh, um, of of governance and, and organizations will will follow. So you'll have the health. I think the next one will be energy, to tell you the truth, because of the the focus on the importance of energy. But it's more than that, uh, Ronan. For me, um, any company, even if it's not currently in the list of uh, in this two as as applicable requirements, this is now going to be the benchmark. OK, this is the benchmark that's going to be applied across all, all major enterprises are going to look at this and go, OK, hang on a second. If that's being expected, if that's the benchmark for, for me to ensure ICT stability, uh, then I want to apply that in my organization as well. So ICT suppliers were going to have to face this, uh, even if they don't have that many financial sector customers. They are going to start facing more demanding um, requirements from major players on the market, whether they're on this list or not, because a, a benchmark has been set. OK, so it's best practice now. You have to have a risk management uh, uh, framework. The first thing that entities, major entities are going to be turning around to the ICT suppliers and say, show me your risk management framework. So even though it is not, um, it, it's not, so you say it, it's now only applicable to the financial industry and, and the key ICT uh, players in that sector. It's it's going to be now very quickly becoming standard practice. You will also find that it will have the same impact that that GDPR had in in setting the baseline internationally, right? So after GDPR, you had all these these privacy regulations coming out, and it and they vary just a tad bit. But at the end of the day, uh, the European impl uh, implementation of GDPR set a kind of international standard for privacy and and privacy treatment. The same way Dara is going to do uh, across industries, all major players are going to go for this benchmark, in my opinion. Um, thank you. Khalid, can I ask you, is this, um, I recently attended an event with Forcepoint in Egypt where you guys had 50 banks from the region in attendance and there was a, an awful lot of discussion around your SASE capabilities and Forcepoint 1 and Forcepoint data visibility and Forcepoint classification and data loss prevention. Um, uh, there wasn't a lot of discussion, obviously, in the Middle East around DORA, um, and I had mentioned it to a few people and they, it had not been on their radar. Um, I'm wondering, do you anticipate that you will start seeing the conversation level at a banking? I know Forcepoint have an, an awful lot of banking customers globally. Do you anticipate that the conversations around this is, are going to ramp up in the coming uh, weeks and months? Yeah, I think so, and I think across uh, not only just Europe uh, or Middle East, but I think across the across the globe. Uh, I uh, as uh, I see this as the first step. Uh, I think there's going to be more legislation, and I think, uh, as Rosa said, I, I think there's going to be uh, uh, you know energy and uh, and food security and so forth. We we live in a world where cyber uh, warfare is actually you know is, is a really significant risk um, and we do have geopolitics uh, the banks in middle east are currently uh, especially in saudi they have something called sama which is a regulatory authority that has yes. now uh, you know created some significant laws around around that typically around data sovereignty and security data residency is a big issue so we see uh, we see more of this taking place and I see more and more uh, effectively uh, what I would call, um, you know, a, a sector specific legislation that is now being adopted by EU states and ultimately they will use this and similarly across Middle East and Africa, we already did this sort of work in Qatar, by the way, where we looked at sharing intelligence uh, and it was based on entities, 130, 140 entities that we classified as critical uh, to, to you know, operations in that region. So again, there is that 
you know, CNI, critical national infrastructure type of mandates that are taking place and banking uh, uh, is, is one of them. And uh, uh, certainly Egypt is, um, you know, a pretty significant uh, uh, seg segment in that. But ultimately, force point, you know, given that it's global, is going uh, is already seeing and we are looking at regional uh, uh, conversations and regional laws and legal frameworks that are occurring in Saudi and Qatar and the Middle East. So for us, you know, it becomes incredibly important to look at zero trust and SASI in that uh, that concept because we have so many that we have to be compliant to. There are so many different uh, elements to it. Um, so when you look at Gartner guys, right, Gartner or, or Forrester or any IDC or any of these analyst, uh, analysts that are out there, they're all gravitating towards um, uh, the kind of mantra that organizations need to consolidate, they need to standardize, they need to simplify and they need to embrace cutting edge technology to deal with the scale of the problem. Right. So they, I, I, they, they use those kind of four pillars. And while I was doing my research on Dora, it sounded like uh, a big part of it is the consolidation of risk because there's so many different moving parts. There's so many, so much different areas of complexity that they want to standardize it into um, a bucket that says, look, this is the new benchmark that we use. Would that be a fair uh, statement to make, Rosa? Do you, do, you, do you think, is it, is it, does that make sense what I've just said? Um, yes, it, uh, it makes totally sense. Um, although, you know, organizations are totally free to, to, to define how they want to uh, address risk management, okay? But we have seen, and, I, and I'm pretty sure, um, you know, it's the experience of anyone in the compliance uh, area where um, risk management is not fully um, implemented in organizations and it's very much uh, segregated to a compliance function or sometimes to information security function. And it's not seen as really truly implementing a risk based thinking model within the organization. What this is going to require, and exactly to simplify and to consolidate, as you said, we want us to, an organization to truly uh, implement risk based thinking. And in so see risk management as an onion structure where you know you have this strategic risk has to be seen and has to be discussed and has to be analyzed at a manager, senior management level. Then you have to have, uh, and please note this is also something that people should clarify the. The ICT uh, risk management requirements now in DORA is not your typical information security risk management. And then that must be clear in people's mind because up to now, okay, we have our, our information security risk rate as a check on the on the box. No, we are going, we are not looking only in information security. We're looking business continuity, we're looking at hardware components, we're looking at finding single points of failure. So it's a more integrated uh, uh, information security and it has to work with the other business areas. It has to work with privacy to make sure that the controls are there to protect uh, um, personal data. It has to work with uh, with procurement because it has to see uh, how security, how these, these, these uh, analysis are done during a procurement process. It has to work with business owners to see if the business continuity aspect is contemplated. So risk management has to be cross-functional, it cannot be a silo, and it cannot be just, you know, uh, hang on, because we have a risk register, that's fine, compliance done. It has to be real to be effective. So organizations have to think about how they're doing, how are they really implementing risk-based thinking in the organization? Does it come naturally? Is it embedded into processes? Does it flow? You know, do you start a project by analyzing risks? Do you start um, a discussion of, you know, changing something on your infrastructure, in ICT infrastructure with a risk analysis? It has to flow. It cannot be, you know, oh, it's time to do a risk register, let's look, everybody check your risks, are you okay with this? Done for compliance. It has to stop being a compliance issue. It has to be integrated in business as usual. Okay. Um, so one of the things that to simplify is exactly, let's please simplify and make things integrated because it's this looking at everything in silos, so, uh, data privacy here, uh, supplier, risk man uh, supplier management there, uh, information security there, I ICT management there, is is what co what causes a lot of rework in organizations and 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 you, and you and you didn't have kind of gaps between the visions of the various areas so guys um while responsibilities and accountability should be given to the various owners and the and, and the departments the areas of the business should work together so that 
you know, risk management can actually be fun. And instead of putting everybody looking at a boring Excel sheet, you know, do brainstorming, do your fishbone exercises, do whatever, they, all those old-fashioned ma management techniques to make, uh, uh, put people discussing, you know, the, you know, what can go wrong and how are we really protected? So it becomes real and useful to an organization. Okay. Um, that's really good. Could I ask you, Cleve, we, we've, we've about five minutes left. Um, so I, I mentioned a moment ago that if you go to Gartner, Gartner are going to say, look, you need to consolidate your, you have too many tools, you need to consolidate, you need you consolidate your tools, you need to standardize, you need to simplify, and you need to use cutting edge technology because of the sophistication of the problem and the scale of the problem. How are force point addressing those four pillars, standardization, simplification, um, uh, the cutting edge technology and consolidation. How would you how would you say Force Point are addressing that from because you guys are a technology company at the end of the day, you're delivering the the tools that people are using to solve these problems. If you could maybe touch on on how you do sure. that. Sure. So so Force Point, um, uh, you know, has has embarked on a number of um, uh, themes and one of the predominant one was uh, creation of what we call the Force Point One data first, uh, that data first SASE uh, acquisitions with uh, a number of companies that led to that. But ultimately, our Force Point One is a consolidated platform. So what, what actually practically happens is that tools do not integrate well. So you've got best of breed tools, uh, lack of resources with skills and I, I have practical experiences of people uh, creating you know within a governance framework not having the proper governance uh, and, and making a change which led to 50,000 servers of blue screen of death um, and what ha has been happening for a while actually is that we have had cutting edge sophisticated technology that's very difficult for a simpleton to operate. Uh, it needs sophisticated people and that becomes difficult. So Force Point One is a platform that addresses all the typical gateways that you would have and the threat vectors and actors that come with it. So does the, you know, the, so the SWIC component, the CASB component, the ZTNA, these are all the gateways for which we communicate to the outside world. And then internally we have DLP and Zero Trust CDR, which looks at, you know, sophisticated attack vectors like Stagnophory and others internally we have fit FBA so we have created a, a, a single uh, you know platform which has that capability so we have gone from singular capabilities that customers would typically acquire and then acquire another one this has gone six three hundred percent in terms of capability acquisitions across all those different channels and gateways and therefore also created operational efficiency. The operating model change is actually that that allows you to consolidate and allows you to focus in a way that it gives you a lot more operational efficiency and integrates together because that has been typically the problem. The DLP has not integrated with something else, the vulnerability management to stand alone. So this consolidated platform allows organizations to actually add efficiency create that capability that ultimately increases their baseline, increases their security maturity, which then allows them to adopt to any different legislation that might be thrown at them. Yeah, I've, I've seen um, I've seen the adoption firsthand of force point data visibility and force point classification as a consolidation feature within your stack. And that has um, that has been really interesting to watch how organizations are trying to, uh, you know, consolidate all of these tools into a single platform. And organizations have such a data sprawl, they don't classify, they don't have visibility of where it is until it's breached. And when Correct. you have a breach, you do a breach investigation, you realize that there were certain elements that should have been, you know, controlled and there was no control mechanism in it. So with get visibility, we've been able to use that uh, to actually look at the crown jewels of an organization and then create a treatment plan, a risk treatment plan accordingly, that ultimately doesn't add risk by, you know, by an unknown, untrained uh, operator that might therefore not uh, be able to use that technology. Sophisticated technology, the more sophisticated you get, uh, the human error element of it has to be controlled too. So this is why we've also, you know, looked at uh, inside a threat, uh, you know, whether it be, uh, you know, whether you're looking at actually exploiting something or whether you do it accidentally, the impact is the same. 
you know, you happen, still absolutely. have a breach and you still get fined. I mean, I, I, I think you've touched very eloquently on the pillars that we've talked about. You've talked about consolidation, you've talked about standardization, you've talked about simplification and in obviously using, um, you know, t tools like get visibility within your stack, you're, you're using our AI and so forth and machine learning to help, um, you know, deal with the scale of that problem. Um, Rosa, I have, I have a, a question here for you. In a constantly evolving landscape of compliance mandates, which we know you love, how would you advise businesses to effectively stay informed and keep up with the latest regulatory requirements? And, and you know, it's for someone like you who's, um, you know, in this 24 7 you really you know you have your finger on the pulse of what's changing and so forth but is there any i guess you know good repositories in terms of keeping abreast of the changes and the nuances of how they may affect a specific industry oh it, it's <laughs> i'd love to have a, a quick answer an easy answer to that one it would make my life also easy i think and anybody yeah. in the compliance in the compliance area uh, you know, you, it, it's it's following one of the recommendations that ISA recommends, which is you have to follow interest groups. There is no other way of doing this. Obviously, uh, keeping um, your ear to the ground of what the European Commission is doing and uh, the things that are in the pipeline will help um, kind of understand where things are flowing to. But there is no, no easy answer and say, oh, this is a, there's a kind of like compliance hotline out there. No, no, no. We have to we have to follow and track. Um, you know, interest groups, which is uh, a good practice anyway, across all areas, not only uh, the compliance one. Okay. okay. So guys, we've just gone over our time by a minute. We're scheduled for 45 minutes. Um, uh, I firstly like to thank you both so much for your insights. It's very clear that you're very passionate and knowledgeable about this sector. And I feel like this, this could go on for another hour easily. Um, is there any final thoughts you'd like to share with us before we wrap up? Rosa. Um, yes, I'd love to. Sorry, let me get my my five cents in here. I think there were there are two concepts that came in Dora that we didn't touch on that I, I really think are important to uh, to bring out. Okay, um, uh, reinforce the supply and security, um, the third party risk, um, and the, and the third party relationships. This is given a lot of focus in um, in 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 this regulation. Um, you have to start looking at at the provider relationships a little bit more intensely, and and um, um, fully understand what suppliers are doing. Um, the other the other aspect here is also uh, people understanding that although they might have a 27001 or a standard implemented, Dora comes out with a new property called authenticity. So um, whether you're already looking at CIA and it's always the CIA that we always hear about um, in, in terms of properties, you now have an additional property. So even though you might have a information security system uh, set up and all your controls set up, you now also have to ensure controls around authenticity. So that's just something I also wanted to add in there. I really enjoyed this conversation. Thank you for for having me and, and uh, Rosa, I hope if, everybody if, enjoyed it. If anybody if, if anybody wants advice or help with this, how do they contact you? <laughs> well, <laughs> oh, how public is this going to be? This is my PII I have to protect. <laughs> 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 so, um, I'm pretty sure uh, you can leave your contacts in the chat and, and okay. we can uh, address that. We, we will most probably also be doing some kind of uh, um, a white paper or a newsletter regarding the topic to be published and you can contact us through the LinkedIn. Not a problem. Thank, thank, okay. thank you. And for me, I thank guess you, when I, uh, to answer your question, uh, you know, I think one of the things that we probably didn't touch on as much, Article 15 to 20 talks about ICT related incidents. And in fact, uh, 21, Article 21 to 24, very heavy around testing uh, as well. So again, I, I would urge organizations to look at this uh, properly. The other thing I, I would say is that eventually the, the bean counters, the accountants would want to get an ROI and, and somewhat, yes. even though it's a legislation. So one of the things that I think you've got to be mindful of is how do you show also the economic benefit of going to a compliance mandate that ultimately helps you increase efficiency, productivity. And for that, 4.1 uh, with 
our reporting and with our single uh, 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 data first SASE and zero trust concept, we're able to show exactly where and what the incidents could have been, how we saved that from happening and how much increase in productivity we have, where the data went, who's using that data, who's sending that data. And all of that actually adds into uh, incident reporting and incident management as well, which is a key aspect of, uh, of the mandate. Fantastic. And on that note, Khalid, thank you so much for your contribution. Rosa, thank you for your contribution. And um, we'll be sharing this webinar online uh, for you guys if you want to review any aspect of it. Uh, thank you so much and uh, have a great day. Thank Bye. you.